Okay, now, uh, uh, the last thing I, I uh, discussed in uh, the recently recorded video was negotiation yes, so, because we are still into the quasi contract. So let me just continue with the remaining portion of chapter one. All right, now, let me just try to reiterate to you. Negotiation yes, you the requisites, okay? So what are these requisites again? There must be a property or business, correct? Two, that it is abandoned or neglected. Number three, there is actual taking possession by the gestor or officious manager, and that such taking possession by the officious manager was not expressly or even tacitly authorized to by the beneficiary or owner. And number five, there is knowledge. Knowledge of what? that the officious manager is caring for the property and or business, not for his own benefit, mm -hmm. but for the benefit of the beneficiary. That is the reason why in that case, uh, between X and Y, the owner X, the owner of the fish pond and Y, who took over it, uh, Y would have the subsequent responsibility and obligation to, of course, uh, surrender or to give X the proceeds of the sale because it was not for him, but rather it was for X. And at the same time, X would have now the duty to pay Y the necessary expenses he incurred and a reasonable compensation for the services rendered. Okay, so tapos na tayo ang negosyo ng gesyo. Now, uh, having, uh, realizing this requisite, I, I will give you now a, a hypothetical question. Okay, so I usually give this every year. There are two contiguous properties. I hope you are able to see it. There are, there are two contiguous properties, okay? agricultural property. One property is owned by X and the other is owned by Y. So maybe yan dan yung boundary niya. Now, uh, the story is X and Y abandoned their agricultural properties uh, for the urban life. So they came to Manila and they worked here and never did return at all for almost five decades or half a century in the Bumalek. And finally, when both of them was of retirement age already, they decided to come back. But it was X who first came back and uh, was just followed by Y. Okay. So, uh, nauna si, si X bumalik. When X returned to the property, he immediately noted that because it was abandoned for nearly five decades, 50 years, the property was in need, desperate need of immediate cultivation and care. Otherwise, it may be totally lost to, due to the erosion and change in the, you know, and everything of that sort. So what he did was to immediately embark uh, to work on the property, cultivate it, and uh, save it from total loss. But because of the change now, of the topography, separate, may matalahib na yan kung ano-ano nang tumubo, it was no longer able to point out the boundary, as a consequence of which X did not only cultivate and save his property, but also extended it to the property of Y. Ayan. Kaya pala, sabi niya, lupa ko. Nagtataka siya. Kahit yung kalabaw na binili niya, na alam niyang kanyang kaya, uh, aruruhin yung, yung lupa niya, ay... Eh, Namatay sa pagod. Oh, kawawa naman. He was wondering what, what seems to be the problem. But he realized that he actually extended the administration, the cultivation of his property to the property of Y. So after a few months, that is only when Y returned. And when Y saw that his property was saved, and as a matter of fact, uh, cultivated, of course, he was overjoyed. It is only the time that X realized 
that he exceeded or extended his effort in saving the property, not just what belonged to him, but also that that was the part of why. Okay, so the issue here now, so of course, yung nakita ngayon ni, ni XY na naglulundag sa tuwa, in-approach na ngayon si Y. At tinabi niya, Y, oh, uh, nakabalik ka na pala. Sabi niya, oh, oh, eh, oh, Y, oh, ang ganda ng property mo. Sabi nga ni Y, oh, oh, nga X, eh, ang ganda eh. So that is when X said already, Y, ako ang may dalyan yan. Pinagurang ko yan, ginastusan ko yan. Yung buhay ng kalabaw ko dyan, inalay ko. So sabi ni Y, oh, thank you, X, thank you. Abay, sabi ni X, hindi lang po pwedeng thank you yan. Why? Kailangan naman bayaran mo ko sa dinastos ko, okay, for my effort and for the life of my karabaw. Alright. That is when now, why objected and said, Aba, X, sinabi ko ba sa yung alagaan mo, ligtasin mo, cultivate mo? No. There was no authority, there was no agreement that I Thank you. So I don't have any obligation to pay you, reimburse you, and maybe compensate you reasonably for the effort that you did in saving my property. So thank you lang. Aba. So that is when now X approaches to. The question is, is there a civil obligation that X now can insist on Y to fulfill? That if he does not do so, it will be a basis for a cause of action in the courts of law. So we, if you will base it entirely on natural law, kagad sa sabi mo, dapat naman i-compensate ni, ni, ni Y, si X for the effort done. Because if we do not allow any cause of action of X on Y to compensate, to reimburse, then, that is a clear example of unjust enrichment on the part of Y at the expense of X. Correct? Okay. So, what could it be? What could be the possible source? So, if you insist that there is a civil obligation, you must be able to point out what is the possible source of that obligation. So, it cannot be law. Neither is it a contract. As a matter of fact, it is the main argument of why there was no agreement. So the closest is, of course, quasi-contract. But what type of a quasi-contract could this be uh, the basis of the obligation of Y now, or, or, or the obligation of Y to X? So is it because you're of this? Because it appears to be uh, what uh, may be involved. Why? All right, let's look at it. So is there a property or business? Yes, property. Is it abandoned or neglected? Yes, no question about it. Was there actual taking possession by X of the property of Y? Answer, yes. Was there now or, or did Y uh, not give any authority express or tacit to uh, X to cultivate his property? Answer, yes. So it appears that the four first requisites that are enumerated in the board are present. So is it because you're yes, you? You need to proceed with the fifth knowledge. Okay, so what does this mean? We said that X, the officious manager or the gestor in this case, if ever, should have knowledge, should know that he is actually caring for this property of Y, not for his selfish benefit, but rather for the benefit of the beneficiary or owner or Y. So, dapat alam ni X na ginagampan niya na ito para kay Y, hindi para sa kanya. Now, is that present in the story that I related to you? Answer, no, it was not present. Because X thought that the portion belonging already to Y was still part of his property. Therefore, there was no knowledge of carrying this portion for the benefit of why, but still for and his own self-interest. So is it because you're just you? Answer, no. So what is it? 
is there a civil obligation? I believe we should insist. Otherwise, why will be unjustly enriched at the expense of that? So we said, answer, yes. But this time, it is not negotiorum DSU class, but rather it is in Article 2154, which is the principle of solutio in the BT. Yeah, so besides it, oh, very common and naman yet. What is solutio in debiti? All right. So uh, if you will read the provision of the civil code, solutio in debitis, ano ba yun? Is, is another quasi contract, okay, where it says merely if something is received when there is no right to demand it, it was unduly and duly delivered through mistake, the obligation to return arises. Now, would this situation of X and Y be covered by the principle of solutio in debiti? Now, from the definition of 2154, there are only three essential requisites of solutio in debiti. What are they? Number one, something is delivered. So there is something that is delivered or what you call to do, service rendered. All right, service rendered. Mm. All right. Number two, that there was no right, no right to what? To receive the thing that was delivered or to be benefited by the service rendered. Walang karapatan yung recipient ang ibig sabihin. So, no right to receive or to be benefited by the service rendered. Uh, why? Because the third requisite now is that because the delivery or the service of the uh, or the rendition of the, the rendition of the service was by miss so if you look at now the situation or the story that we provided uh, uh, you here regard to the X and Y, all these requisites are present. Was something delivered? Yes. X delivered not only the, the, the fertilizer, not only the plant, not only his effort, but even the life of his carabao. So, second, did Y have that right to receive, to be to be serviced by X in regard to the cultivation of his property? Answer, none. There was no right on the part of Y to have received and benefited from him. Okay? And the third, obviously, then why was there a delivery of the services and the things that uh, in a way benefited Y? Because X did it by mistake. Bakit mistake? Akala niya kasi ito ay kanya pa. So this is the principle of solutio in debiti. So the right of X to demand from Y compensation and reimbursement of the expenses incurred in cultivating and saving the property would now be a cost of action in the courts of law. Clear? It is very clear. Now, I want you to please read the provisions of Solution in Debit. Of course, there in the textbook, the most popular uh, Supreme Court decision involving Solution in Debit is that a celebrated case of Mellon Bank uh, of New York versus Magsino. Mellon Bank of New York versus Magsino. Now, what happened to this case? Uh, it is about the, the remittance of dollars from New York uh, to the recipient here in the Philippines. So, the, the, uh, the, uh, a certain uh, uh, Dolores Ventosa in New York requested through Mellon Bank, New York, the transmittal of 1,000 US dollars in favor of his spouses Javier here in the Philippines. Alam mo, nung mga panahon na yan, uh, transfer of funds 
is not as easy as it is now where you could do it uh, even when you are in the toilet doing your thing. You can transfer millions of pesos from one bank anywhere in the world. At that time, you need to go to a bank and the bank is going to transmit it directly not to your recipient but to it's what you call corresponding bank. May bank ko rin dapat nakakorespond. So, the corresponding bank of Melon Bank here in the Philippines, where he they will transmit supposedly the 1,000 US dollars and release to the beneficiary or to the recipient, uh, Javier Spouses, was uh, Citibank of New York, Manila. Kaya lang ang nangyari dito, you know, it was done in a computerized pa yan, na nung kanon, there was a computer glitch that instead of reflecting the actual amount of just $1,000, abay nagdagdagan lang ng, ng apat na zero, making it appear that Melon Bank is requesting now, Citibank Manila, the release to the Javier's, the recipient, not just the amount of $1,000, US dollars, but one million when notice was given to the spouses to come over to the bank in order to receive the amount, one million pesos. So pinuha and they left him. Now, it took some time. Hindi katulad ngayon, sandali na lang. But then, it took some time before Melon Bank discovered the glitch. And because of this, they immediately communicated with Citibank Manila to represent them in getting back the excess. Uh, that was what you call now release to the spouses of year. Of course, the house party is open. Wala na, nag-gastos doon. Napampinin na kung ano-ano, nagpakas sila. Wala na ata. Kukukunti na lang ang natitira. So, the spouses, they are refused to return what they may have received, arguing that it was given to us. We did not know. Of course, we just received it. We were in good faith. That was their contention. So, the issue here is, therefore, may Melon Bank through its representative in Manila, pursue a civil action to compel the Javier spouses to return the excess. So obviously you know now that the answer is yes. Because if you will not allow it, then again, a situation where the Javier spouses are unjustly enriched at the expense of Melon Bank and New York, Manila. So what is the source of the obligation? So Lucio indemnity. Clearly, take note, uh, it was something delivered to the spouses of year by Melon Bank through New York, uh, Manila, uh, City Bank, Manila. Yes! Was why? Because the Javier's did not have a right to get one million. They only had a right to receive 1,000 US dollars. Now, why was it delivered to them, the one million? Because it was a computer glitch, a mistake. In effect, obviously, the Supreme Court declared that Javier would have a, a, a civil obligation to return. Now, please take note of the most important provisions there. Because the spouses refused to immediately return the amount of money, and it took some time. It took some time now for them to return it, or Melon Bank to retrieve it, denying them, therefore, Within that years, uh, the, 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 the amount of money, the question is, could Mellon Bank demand, aside from the excess, interest, legal interest, or even damages? So the rule there, as you will take note of, the, 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 the uh, what you call now, plaintiff or complainant, uh, it would only be entitled to interest and damages, or the the debtor will be subject to payment of both interest and damage if they were in bad faith. Now, how how do you know whether or not the 
the debtor in solution indebitis in bad faith or not? Of course, obviously, if they receive the amount, knowing fully well that they did not have that right to receive it, and they just kept them, they just they 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 still got the the wrong payment or the wrong service rendered, then he may be considered in bad faith. In this particular case, I think if, the, if my memory serves me right, the Javier were also liable for damages because they knew that the 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 uh, the, uh, the relative who remitted to them the amount knew that what was to be sent only was one thousand dollars. So there was already a presumption of knowledge of which they should have immediately returned. So please take note of uh, the others, uh, the, uh, particularly the instances when, when there is uh, no longer any need to, uh, to return. Uh, for example, in the, the provisions there where uh, uh, the, if the uh, yung mga situations there's sa article 2162 and others, so just please read it for purposes of your examination. Now, although there is a mistake of the delivery, but there are instances when the obligation to deliver is no longer enforceable. For example, if it was a payment made to this debtor of which he actually would have a right to collect and so on and so forth. So, basahe ito na lang yan. But those are the two very important provisions. One, when is the debtor in solucio in debity not just liable for the return of what was delivered by mistake, but also for interest and damages? And secondly, when would that debtor no longer be obligated to return, even if it is proven that what was delivered to him or service rendered was uh, by mistake? You understand, class? So I leave it na to you. Okay. So, tapos na ako ng solusyo in debity. And now, the last would be the other quasi-contracts. So, itong other quasi-contracts are very specific. So, you need to read and remember these provisions because a situation uh, or a given set of facts might might uh, be might might zero or might might exactly be what is being described by the different other quasi contracts, which you will find now, of course, from twenty one sixty four up to twenty one seventy five. Iba iba yan. They are divided into the following one one uh, example. In uh, the first one. Giving of legal support and payment of funeral expenses. So a third party is the one who gave support to a person entitled from the parents. Okay, So it is a third person. But the parents never authorized that third person. Uh, it was done voluntarily. Now, would that third person now be entitled to be reimbursed from the parents or the party who has the duty really to support the beneficiary? Answer, yes. Funeral expenses. Uh, if a third person who finds a body who should also be given what you call a decent and honorable burial but was left there oh, in the streets, kawawa naman. So naawa ka, eh, eh, binuhat mo, inuwi mo, binigya, pinalamay mo, and so tas bi, uh, linibing mo. Pagkatapos mong libingin, sakalang lumabas yung mga kamag-anak who under the law is obliged to provide for that service and expenses. So the question is, can you now be asked to be reimbursed by the relatives? Or can the relatives uh, put up the defense. Aba, hindi naman namin sinabi sa'yo, ipalibing mo yan. Kaya nga namin talaga, iniwan namin yan sa putang yan, tarantado yan, mabulok yan dyan. He does not deserve at all a decent and what you call now uh, uh, formal uh, burial. 
because he was such an evil person when he was alive. I'm deeply afraid of that. Because again, you will have to con pro uh, take note of the provision of what you call the Kazer Kwasai contract. Now, the next, the, the, the other one would be the referring to the concept of acts of a good Samaritan. O, ito na yung papasok dyan, yung sinasabi ko sa inyo. Na pag nakita ninyo, ako bigla akong nanigas dito. Oh, so I'll go and exert effort to help me out, calling a doctor and bringing me to the hospital in that regard. So any expenses you incur will not be your obligation, but rather it would be the obligation of my family. So that is, in, of course, the concept of acts of a good Samaritan. And then you have the third person who pays debt or taxes of another. Oh. It's all there. Basahin nyo lang yan. Uh, Self-explanatory uh, na yan. And the last one, acts in consideration of general welfare. So there are, there are uh, uh, four other types of quasi-contract, which may not necessarily be covered by negocio rumbesio or solutio indebiti. So these are number one giving legal support and payment for funeral expenses by third person. Number two, well, acts of a good Samaritan. Number three, the third person paying for the debt or taxes of another. And number four, acts in consideration of general welfare. So just look at the provisions, read, memorize, not, not uh, verbatim, but remembering them. That when you are confronted with facts that clearly illustrates now any of the provision, you know very well that there is a civil obligation and the basis of which is the positive law on other quasi-contract. By the way, this concept of quasi-contract uh, are further classified into four. They are the do o des, ito, oh yeah, do o des, Okay, that is, I give that you may give. Yeah. And then you have do put fasias. Fasias. That is, I give that you may do. And then you have fasio put des. Okay, which means I do that you may give. And finally, you have fascio ut fascias. Okay. Kailangan ninyong malaman itong mga Latin terms na ito. Dahil may, uh, minsan tinatad, what is fascio ut fascias? I do that you may do. It's just important that you know these Latin terms because it is not uncommon now in the bar that the examiner would ask you know, phrases in Latin and ask you what the definition may be. So pag nakita nyo, what is fascio ut fascia? Good, kaya nakamot ulo mo pag hindi ko nabanggit yan sa inyo dito. Alam ninyo na that if it is fascio ut fascias, you will refer to it as a principle, as the basis for other quasi-contract which really mean that you doing something so that the other may do also something for you. All right. Clear? So I am done with so with uh, uh, other or, or quasi-contracts. So there are three kinds of them. One, uh, negotiorum decio. Two, solutio indebiti. And the other quasi-contract. All right. I forgot. Now, in relation to solutio indebiti, because this is very important. This was also given in the bar examination recently. The, the distinction or the, the similarity between the concept of in rem verso and solutio indebiti. So where do we find the principle of in rem verso? Nasana pa yung eraser ko dito. Okay, so ito pala. Alright, so I will erase this now. Ha? Uh, in rem verso. I-hold ko muna para hindi humaba itong... itong... Alright. So before we totally leave uh, quasi-contract, there is one very important issue because as I've said, was recently uh, asked in the bar. The difference between 
The principle of solution in debity, which we have just discussed, 2154, and the principle of in reverso, Article 22, which was part of the assignment I told you. So if you uh, did not read it, do it now, please. Basahin niyo. Okay. Now, you will note that they, they seem to be very similar. Okay. So what are the similarities between the two? We immediately point out that these two principles uh, in the civil code are, uh, are, are, are to avoid the unjust situation where one person is unjustly enriched at the expense of another. So the objective of these two principles would really to avoid that unfair situation of allowing one to be unjustly enriched at the expense of another. So that is the, the common version. In effect, you will know, in both instances, uh, it involves what you call now a lawful, a voluntary, a unilateral act. Pareho yan. You understand? So that would be the similarity so, uh, 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 that creates a juridical relation so as no one could be uh, unjustly enriched at the expense of uh, another. But what now would be the difference between the two? All right. The main difference between the two is that you will see that in solutio in debiti, why was there a delivery? Why was there a, a performance to a person who did not have a right to receive it or to be benefited by the same? Why? Because there was a mistake. Ah, oh, may mistake. However, when it comes to Article 22, which is in, in Remberso, in rem no mistake. So, ibig sabihin, alam, the, the creditor here knew that he is delivering something or rendering a service to the debtor who then did not have a right to receive it. So, he knew. Dito, hindi alam. It was by a mistake. So if that be the case, you will see now that there is still a civil obligation and it would therefore be the case of in rem verso. Now because of this, in rem verso, if you are to be asked, uh, is one of those provisions of law that creates an obligation. Ang ibig sabihin, the obligation brought about by the situation of in rem verso arises from law. Oh, that's no. So it is not quasi contract. While the obligation arising from solutio in debiti is quasi contract. Mm. So there are therefore two distinctions between in rem verso and solutio in debiti. What are these? One, in solution in debity, mistake is involved. While in in reverso, there is no mistake. No mistake whatsoever. You see? And secondly, you will know that if you were to be asked as to what is the source of the obligation arising from, from this mistake, it is quasi-contract specifically solutio in debiti. While here, the obligation is arising not from quasi-contract, but rather is a creation of law, Article 22. Now, uh, the best example, so you might be thinking, what example is in reverse? The best example usually given, I still do remember Professor Hurado, uh, he, he, he takes off a situation where uh, there are two contiguous properties here. Uh, uh, this is the property which again belongs to X and this property belongs to Y. Now see that the property of X is on a higher ground. Um, uh, sa lower ground yung property the Y. Now, Y uh, does have what you call a 
uh, ay livestock. So, meron siyang uh, cattle dito. So, may mga baka siya dyan. Ayan, baka. Ayan, ayan. So, baka. Okay, meron siyang mga sheep dyan. May mga hayop siya dyan. Well, dito kay X, may tanim siya dyan na, na, na pala. Ito, may tanim dyan. Now, uh, there was an occasion where there was an occasion where due to uh, so heavy rainfall the the this property of why was now in the danger of being flooded and if the cattle were left alone they would all be lost they would drown you said now why is not around okay so wala dyan si why so anong ginawa ni x seeing the situation X now allowed his cattle to go up his rice field. Kita nyo? Para maligtas ni yung cattle ni Y. And as a consequence, eh syempre, nasira yung tanim ni X dyan. But X was able to save the cattle of Y. So in this case, would X have a right of course of action to at least compel Y to reimburse him for the expenses of his palai that he sacrificed to save the cattle? Answer, yes. And what would be the basis? No. Is it Lucio in debity? No. Why? Did X allow the cattle to come up because he thought it belonged to him? No. He knew that the cattle belonged to Y. So there was no mistake. But in so doing, was he requested by why? No, there was no agreement. He did it on his own volition. So in effect, the only source by which we could point to is in rem verso. Iba yan to sa, describe to sa quasi-contract because in quasi-contract, it, it, it speaks more of a loss due to unfortunate event. Oh, do you understand now? Huh? So, I repeat, just to reiterate, what would be the distinct or the similarity between solutio in debite and in reverso? Right. Number one, both principles are designed by the civil code to avoid a situation where one is unjustly enriched at the expense of another. Okay. Number two, both principles uh, connotes or describes a situation where one person receives something but did not have a right to receive or be benefited by the service rendered. Uh, thereafter, okay, okay, you will note that uh, you go to the distinction. So what is the distinction? The most important distinction is that in solution indemnity, there is a mistake in the delivery or rendering of the services rendered, while in, in reimbursement, there is no mistake. Of course, I think ugly now naman na yan. Finally, uh, we go to the last two provisions. Now, uh, yung uh, Article 1161. What is Article 1161? Delict or crime. So, uh, now, uh, what do you only have to, to remember in, in uh, delict or crime as a source of obligation? Article 100 must be reviewed by you, which you took up in criminal law one. What does it state? It states that any person who is criminally liable is likewise civilly liable. So in effect, this is the only source that is quite unique that generally creates two separate distinct Obligations. What are these two distinct separate obligations? The obligation that is criminal, which would involve either going to prison or paying a fine, depends on what is the penalty uh, being imposed by the law. And the civil, what would now be uh, the basis for the civil obligation? So you have it in Article 104, 
500, 500, 600, 7. Just review it, please. But it refers to the civil obligation, either restitution, reparation, and indemnification. Oh. Ibig sabihin, okay, restitution. Pag ninakaw mo yung, yung kotse, carnapper, alright? So you were found guilty, you go to prison. That is your criminal obligation, prison. But can you say, oh, Ay, mabibilanggo naman ako. So, akin na lang yung kotse. Ah, gago. Tratado ka ba? Ibalik mo pa yan. At pag hindi mo na naibabalik dahil nabenta mo ng tarantado ka, then rep, uh, uh, restitution. You pay for the amount or value of the car. O, oh, dalawa yan. Second, okay. Say, uh, sinunog mo yung bahay, yung kaway mo, arson. So you were found guilty. All right? Criminal obligation. Go to prison. Now, is there what you call now civil? Pwede mo ba sabi? Kung nabibilanggo naman ako, wala na. O, oh, ito na ang bayad. Ay, de! Gago. Bayaran mo yung bahay na sinira mo. So what is that? It is what you call now reparasyon. And finally, you kill someone, sinaksak mo. Oh. Papatay. Okay. Criminal obligation, go to prison. How about uh, civil obligation? Oh, dito napapasok yung theory ni, ni Tolentino na kahit ang buhay na ta ang tao ay hindi dapat okay, pinipresyuhan. Still, the necessity to evaluate a certain money value for the life that you ended abruptly. So, civil obligation, indemnification. Bakit indemnification? Of course, mababalik mo pa ba yung buhay? Oh, oh, buhay ka ulit. Balik ka. So, it cannot be restitution. Is it, uh, 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 maayos mo pa ba? Yung sinaksak mo, ayusin mo, yung bito ka, yan, yan. Oh, so, it cannot be reparasyon, but rather, it would be what you call indemnification. Oh. Now, there are only two questions that you need to, to, of course, this is no longer part of it, but it's important that you know it in the loan obligation. Two, two very important issues here. The question is, diba, I stated that this type of source is quite unique in the effect that it is the only one that creates two separate distinct obligation, criminal and civil. Now the question is, if a person commits a crime, is it possible legally to merely incur criminal and no civil? Answer, yes. If the offense committed would not result to any basis for what you call indemnification, reparation, or what you call restitution. If there is no basis to justify the imposition of this civil liability, and the wala, example, jaywalking. Yeah, you, you, you violate an ordinance on jaywalking. Oh, nahuli ka. Is that a crime? Yes. Ordinance. So what is your penalty? You pay a fine. Is that a civil? No, that is criminal. But that's the difference between the civil obligation and the penalty. Interest, kumbaga, sa banko, interest from penalty. Pag penalty, talagang, that is what you call now the sanction for violation. Now, question. So aside from paying the fee, can there be a justification to still require you to pay civil liability? Answer? Abay, no. Bakit? Oh, what, what are you going to return? Pag nag-jaywalking ka. Nag-jaywalking ka. Oh, nag-jaywalking ka. Return. Restitution. Babalik ka. Oh, balik, balik, balik. Ay, gago. Saka pa, balik mo yan. Masaga sa ang kapang. Pangalawa, is there something that you destroy that you need to repair? Or pay for the expenses for the repair or replacement? Bakit? Nung lilakaran mo ba yung kalsana? Parang ang si Incredible Hulk na nabuwal yung kalsana? Hindi. Oh, grabe. Ano mo ka ba? Hindi ka Avengers. Alabanger. Alabanger ka. Kung bakit alabang ka. Pag nagamit jola ka, 
kung tawag sa iyo, menjoler, ay ang pangit ko lang. Ordinary citizen lang kayong mga taga-menjoler. Oh. And then, are you going to, whom are you going to indemnify? No one. So in effect, jaywalking is a crime, the commission of which creates one single obligation, the criminal. Now, examples of this are, of course, uh, like the, the crimes against the state. Like, for example, uh, uh, you are caught, you know, uh, uh, printing fake money bills. Even if you have not used it, okay, that is already a crime to which you may be criminally liable. But there is no way by which you can justify the imposition on you, a, 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 an act for restitution, uh, reparation, or indemnification, so on and so forth. Do you understand, class? All right. Now, on the other hand, is it possible that a person who commits a crime will incur only civil obligation, no criminal obligation. Baliktad naman ngayon. Answer, yes. And what would this be? Now, you remember your criminal law? JEMA. Article 11, 12, 13, 14. JEMA. Justifying, exempting, mitigating, aggravating. Now, what am I referring to? So justifying and exempting. If the crime is committed, attended by any of the justifying or exempting circumstances, you know very well already that the offender does not incur criminal liability, but the possibility of still incurring civil liability. For example, a, a, a child who is not considered yet to have discernment commits a crime. Exempting yan, di ba? There is no way by which you could impose imprisonment on the child or an insane person. However, there is a way by which he can be held liable civilly. That's it. I am done now with acts or omission punishable by law. And finally, the last 1162 quasi delhi right now i will not take time to discuss exhaustively quasi delhi because as i have made mention uh, this subject matter 2176 and up to the, the chapter on damages would be taken up separately by you in second year in the course torts and damages but it is important at this point, to at least know the concept of quasi delic Now, initially, quasi delic na naman. So, ang ibig sabihin nito, it is like a crime. Kasi hindi ba yung crime is delic Ngayon, ito na naman, quasi delic So, in effect, there would have to be similarities between the two. Similarity between quasi delic and delic what are the similarities between the two? All right. First, Delhi. Is it unlawful? Yes, unlawful. Kaya nga crime niyan. Quasi Delhi. Is it unlawful? All right. Now go to 2176. Read it. All right. What does Article 2176 tell you? 2176 tell you who, by uh, who says that? Yeah, whoever by act or omission, causes damage to another. So that alone is already sufficient enough to tell us that it is also unlawful. So just like crime. Two, is, is a, a, a delicate, what you call now, a, a what the, uh, uh, is it, uh, does, that, does it involve an act or omission? Answer, yes. Killing someone is an act or omission. It's an act. Omitting to doing an act. Not feeding someone you are responsible for. How about a quasi-delic? Is it also an act or omission? Yes, it is also an act or omission. Okay? Now third, delic. 
Does that act or omission cause damage or injury to another? Answer, yes, generally. That is the reason why it gives rise to the civil obligation of either reparation, restitution, or indemnification. Now, how about quasi -telling? Does it give rise or does it cause damage or injury to another? Yes, it causes uh, damage or injury to another. Oh. And then finally, you ask the question, delic, is it a voluntary act or omission? Answer, yes, of course. Alam mo, sinabi mo, ay sir, nasaksak kita. Ay sorry sir, ay naulit ko sir. Ay sorry na naman sir, nasaksak na naman kita. Okay. Of course, that is a voluntary act. You see, it is a voluntary. You in you voluntarily not do it, or you voluntarily do it at your own belief. How about quasi daily? Is it also a voluntary act? Oh, I don't know. Kakamali ng karamihan law student, they will say it is not. But it is also a voluntary, unlawful act or omission that causes damage or injury to her. So what is the difference between the two? Akala namin, sir, yung quasi daily is not voluntary because it is uh, 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 un it is it, it's an accident. No, my friends, it is also voluntary. You see? For example, you have a sports car and then you want to show it off. A Porsche, you want to show it off. So what do you do? So you drive your Porsche car in a very populated area where there are so many pedestrians. Minalabang sa puti, minaniw mo. Yabang ko kaya sa Mindyola, yabang ko. O, pinaspasan mo. Kung alam nga naman, you are not doing that voluntarily. You are doing it voluntarily. See? That is a very negligent act for you to overspeed. Particularly in places where it is overcrowded, where there are so many pedestrians, you you disregard the maximum speed limit of the place. Is that something that you do voluntarily? Yes. So what is the difference between the two? The difference really is the intent. Get the point? Okay. What do you mean the intent? The intent of causing damage or injury to another. In acts or omission punishable by law, you did the voluntary okay, act right, that causes damage or injury to another okay, with the intention of just achieving that goal. While in quasi tele, you may have voluntarily done the default or negligence, but without intention of causing damage or injury to another. You get the point? Double, you do portion up. So you drive it. You are driving it. You are driving it. You are driving it. You are driving it. You ng logo ng San Pedro. Patayin ko na yan at pinahihirapan ako sa oblikon. What did you commit? Of course, clearly, intention to who cause damage to that person, it is crime. But if, for example, you were just driving, showing off, no intention whatsoever. And here is this pedestrian, napatama sa'yo, who is wearing a black shirt with a the logo of San Beda, uh, medyo pogi rin sana. Hindi mo napansin, parabundol mo yung tatangatangang yun. In this case, you will have quasi belly Because although you did the voluntary act of fault and negligence, there was the absence of intent. Now, actually, class, this distinction between quasi belly and... Uh, delict or crime has been obliterated already by the principle of culpa criminal. All right. Let me just go through it. Right. Quasi-delict is also known as culpa 
Aquiliana. That is what is being governed by the provisions of 2176. But there are other two kulpas in our jurisprudence, two of which are recognized by the civil code, while the other one is in the revised penal code. What are this? The other is culpa contractual. Okay, that is what is described in Article 1172 and 1173. In the next chapter, we are going to discuss it. Kaya babalikan natin itong 2176 na ito. And the last one is what we refer to as culpa criminal. You will encounter it in this semester in your criminal law 2 subject, which is what you call now the uh, criminal negligence. Now, what is, the, what, what is the concept of criminal negligence? The concept of criminal negligence is that the negligence committed by the person is so gross, is so obvious, that the law presumes already an intention to cause damage or injury. Kaya nga, di ba, pag nagbabanggaan, why is it that what is being filed is a crime with the prosecutor's office? Why? Because the injured party would always want that you be liable for culpa criminal, which will involve now a criminal offense. He is to prove that you grossly committed a negligent act that would allow now the presumption of you intending to cause damage or to another, to that, uh, to that uh, uh, complainant. So actually, na, na obliterate na yan talaga. But I will not touch on culpa criminal because that is in criminal law. I will zero in more on on culpa aquiliana and culpa contractual. So, what are the things that you first need to know about culpa aquiliana? But we will suspend uh, deliberations on this matter because we just need to revive it again when we come to Article 1172 and 73 so that you will, you will see clearly what is the distinction between these two types of culpa. All right. But initially, from the definition, please take note of the essential requisites of quasi delic or culpa aquiliana. What are these? Okay. Number one, there is an act or omission, a voluntary act or omission. Number two, that it causes damage, injury to another. All right. Okay. Number three, right, that there is no pre existing contractual relations between the person committing the act or omission and the party who may have been injured. Number four, that such uh, accident, that such e uh, event that led to the injury, uh, or, or I mean, that the, the, that the, the, the fault or negligence by the respondent, by the debtor, is the proximate, uh, no, no, sorry, mali, 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 that the damage or injury caused to the creditor uh, is the proximate cause of the negligence or fault of the debtor. It dapat may connection. It's not brought about by others' intervening events. Number four, that there is no contributory negligence on the part of the creditor. Wala din siyang umbaga, fault or negligence na nagpabayarin siya kaya nangyari yung accident. Eh. Okay? And uh, uh, nakalimutan ako na tuloy yung yung, yung um, yes, ulitin ko nga. Uh, number one, uh, kalimutan ko na tuloy. Anong nakalagay dito kay Okay, Rebuya. All right, the requisites again, if I may be allowed to reiterate it. Uh, the damage suffered by the plaintiff, there is damage. O oh, yan, importante yan. Yan pala nakalimutan ko. Two, all right, there is fault or negligence on the defendant. Three, connection or cause and effect between the fault 
or negligence of the defendant and the damage incurred by the plaintiff. So, ibig sabihin yan, proximate cause. Yun ang ka, that is the direct cause, uh, the, the fault or negligence of the debtor resulted directly to the injury or damage to the creditor. Uh, and number four, although it is not mentioned here by, by uh, uh, Rebuya, there should be no volunt there should be no contributory negligence on the part of the creditor. So I, I repeat, uh, in the meantime, uh, this is the only matters that you have to understand. Ay, yung panglima pala, I forgot to mention, Okay, that there is no pre-existing contractual relation. So, ulitin nga natin, ulitin. Number one, there is act or omission. Number two, that it was due to fault or damage, to fault or negligence. Number three, that this fault or negligence, okay, brought about damage or injury to another. Number four, that the, the fault, that the, the damage or injury is the proximate cause of the fault or negligence. Uh, and number five, number five, that there is no pre-existing contractual relations. And number six, that there was no contributory negligence on the part of the creditor or the victim. So, uh, what needs to be further expounded or explained in so far as this concept is concerned is of course uh what do we understand by pre-existing contractual relation we will just get to discuss this again plus uh, but uh uh I, I there is the case of air france versus carlos coso that's very important we will take that again but uh in the meantime okay uh, just uh uh, read through the provisions of of Rebuya, not anymore our textbook because my co-author uh, included uh, very lengthy uh, notes there or or uh, you know, pages that I believe is not yet right for you to to understand. So uh, uh, just read please for quasi delic uh, pages uh, twenty eight. Up to page, uh, yeah, like I explained, pala dyan, no, no pre existing contractual relation. Mababa -ba na rin pala ito. Up to page 38. So 10 pages lang dyan. Okay? And then remember what you have read, take notes, because when we reach Article 1172 and 1173, because this now, these are the provisions that describe culpa contractual. We will retrieve. Whatever we have learned in quasi delic 27 and compare and contrast both one from the other. That's it. I am done, my friends. Praise the Lord. Study hard, please. Thank you so much. I will see you now for chapter two.